Luke 2, verses 1 through 21. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria, and everyone went to their own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger, because there was no guest room available for them. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today, in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly, a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven, and on earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary treasured up all of these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. On the eighth day, when it was time to circumcise the child, he was named Jesus, the name the angel had given him before he was conceived. I would like to focus in this morning on, this evening, on verse 14 of the Christmas story. This morning, uh, Roy focused in on this verse as well. And I want to focus in on the word peace. He focused in on to whom God's favor rests. Think about peace for a second. Here we are, A.D. 217. 2017 years after the birth of Christ. And we're not getting any closer to peace, are we? I mean, you look around, you think about this last year that we've had. 2017, a lot of time to try and work toward peace. And it seems like we're probably going the opposite direction, doesn't it? Peace is an interesting thing. Clearly, technology, communication, transportation, especially social media, hasn't gotten us any closer to world peace, right? When you think about this word peace, a lot of images come to mind. Maybe the image of World War I when soldiers on Christmas Eve and Christmas Day just impromptu began to have a cease, a truce fire, ceasefire where they just quit fighting one another. They ignored their commanders, they ignored their officers on many locations in the battlefield and began to actually sing Christmas carols out of the foxholes. And in some reports of some places on the battlefield, soldiers actually came and joined together and exchanged gifts. But that was a peace because the very next day, they returned to their positions and began to fight again. That's not peace. The Hebrew word for peace is the word shalom. And shalom has so much more than the idea of a lack of conflict. The idea of shalom is harmony, completeness, soundness, the absence of any discord. And so tonight, as you're here and with a candlelight and your family maybe is around you, you may feel a sense of, of, of peace. You may feel an extra dose of shalom tonight because the setting is right and you're out of your normal routine and crazy cycle of life and the kids are out of school and things have just got a different pace for the next couple of days. 
But the truth is that this is kind of like a ceasefire, right? And soon we'll return to the hustle and bustle of daily life. We'll return to the boss that we don't really care much for. We'll return to the situations and marriages and be right back to your normal routines where you find conflict all around. But God's goal, God's desire from the beginning was shalom. In fact, if you go back to the very first book of the Bible, Genesis, in chapter 1, verse 31, when God finished his creation, he said that what he, was, what he had made was very good. Shalom, very good. He planted a garden. He placed man in the garden as a caretaker. And Genesis 2 tells us that God made all kinds of trees to grow out of the ground and trees that were pleasing to the eye and good for food. Man was given a wife, a soulmate, a companion. And Genesis 3 tells us that God actually walked in the garden with his prized creation, mankind, and conversed with him. But just like in 2017, it doesn't take long for mankind to shadow peace, and man didn't do so well, did he? And things were messed up, and Romans 12 tells us that just as sin entered into the world through one man, so through one man's sin, sin entered in. Shalom was shattered. The harmony with our Creator was broken. Unless we point the finger at Adam and blame him, Romans 5.12 goes on and says, Death came upon all people because all have sinned. We've all sinned and fallen short of God's glory. And here's the thing. God would have been more than justified to abandon his creation. But not just abandon his creation. He'd have been more than justified to completely destroy the rebellious creation that he had made. And that's what's so amazing about the incarnation. That's what's so amazing about Christmas time is that God didn't destroy, in fact, quite the opposite through his mercy and grace. That he came. He didn't send someone. He personally came to our rescue. And Matthew 1, 21 says that you're to give him the name Jesus. Why? Because he would save his people from their sins. The creator that came like the created, Jesus came into the world to save sinners, Paul says. And the angels announced the coming of this one who would save the people from their sin. They said, glory to God in the highest. On earth peace to those on whom his favor rests. So Shalom came to those who please God, whose God is pleased with them. As Roy pointed out this morning, it's not a universal for everyone. It's for those who receive his gift of salvation. Those who receive Jesus and trust him as their Savior Messiah. That's who God's Shalom is available to. And so whether you realize it tonight or not, you're groaning along with all of creation all this frustrated world that we live in, for it to be restored and life to be as it should be, the way that God intended it from the beginning. Shalom. Peace. And only Jesus, Scripture says, can bring it out. And every one of our souls possesses a dim memory of the shalom of Eden. We may call it, I got a hole in my heart. We may say it's a restlessness, a midlife crisis. But it's an innate longing of the human heart for something outside of itself that every single human being possesses. We crave something, we desire something, and we get little tastes of shalom through God-given common grace that he provides through the good things that he gives in family and friends and relationships and situations. But like a vapor, this taste of shalom is there for a moment and it vanishes away. You know, so much of our tradition of Christmas is about gifts. And I remember as a kid reading the Christmas story before gift opening time, and I felt that, you know, my dad chose the longest chapter of the Bible on purpose. And I'm not sure why we had to read the entire chapter of Luke 2. I mean, we could have stopped at verse 22 like we did today, but we had to read the whole thing. I thought it was torture. And maybe tonight it was torture. I was talking about this with my children earlier. And it's hard not to get your mind on the physical gifts that are there waiting for you, maybe tonight when you get home or tomorrow morning when you wake up. But truly, the greatest gift 
that we can have is shalom, peace with God. Here is here it is. It's said so well in Second Corinthians chapter five, verse eighteen. It says, "And all of this." And what is he referring to there in that passage? He's referring to being a new creation in Christ, a new way of being human. All of this is a gift from God, who brought us back to Himself through Christ. That brought us back to Himself. Shalom, the way that it was intended. An incredible gift. A relationship with God that mankind broke through sin. Peace with God, a restored relationship with the Creator. An incredible gift. But you know, it's only an incredible gift for those who realize that they need it. It's only incredible for those who understand their condition. You see, someone can be young, with lots of life in front of them, not a care in the world, and not realize how broken they are and how huge the hole in their heart actually is. And just go and miss out on the fact. And one day, one day, it will catch up to you and you will see. And here's my prayer for you. And I know this is not the greatest prayer to pray for those who reject Jesus on Christmas Eve from a practical point of view. But I do. I pray that every dream that you seek after and follow that will ultimately cave in on itself will point you to the ultimate peace, shalom. Every hero that you look to, you think is perfect, maybe that guy or that girl, when they fail you, and they will fail you, that will remind you of the hole in your heart for God that only He can fill you. The shalom that you are creating. I pray that the material things, even tonight and tomorrow, kids, that you get, and one day they'll end up in your trash can, I promise you, that you'll remember that moment. Wow. I thought that was the gift to end all gifts. The year that we cleared out toys in. Woody and Buzz went into the trash can on a sad day. In fact, I got death threats on Instagram over that one because I posted a picture, not really death threats, but it was a big deal. But they were broken, they had seen their better days. But people couldn't believe we were throwing those away. But you know, dreams come to an end. When your health fails you, when your loved ones go on before you, I pray that will help you see your need for what only God can provide, which is the relationship you need with Him, shalom, through Jesus Christ. But what about those here who say you have found Jesus, you have Jesus, you have received this gift, but you still, you lack the peace? I'm going to ask you some questions tonight. I want you to think through some things. Have you placed your faith in Jesus and then attempted to live your life independently of Him, honestly? Have you prayed the prayer, signed the card, went to the front, but now you've decided to, I'm going to live my life for me rather than for Christ? And there's this disconnect that we have that we think that we can profess Christ with our lips but live our lives any way we want to live. Whereas... We just looked a few minutes ago that we're new creations in Christ. And we have a new way of being human and living this life. And that's for His glory, not our own glory, and not for ourselves. But if you know Jesus as Savior, God's for you. He's not against you. He desires communion with you, like He did with Adam and Eve in the garden. If this was a Sunday morning sermon, we would look at Philippians chapter 4 at length. There's so much incredible, incredible meat and truth in this passage, but I'm just going to point out a few verses because of time. Paul says in Philippians 4.11, he says, I learned to be content in whatever the circumstance, whatever the situation. You know, that would be easy to say if you're sitting here in a comfortable seat, in a comfortable room, waiting for a big meal, maybe at home tonight, that you know is on the oven, being prepared. There's presents in the tree. Life is pretty good. But Paul, he was able to pen these words in a dingy, 
dirty, disease-filled Roman prison. You know what that tells me? As the Holy Spirit inspired those words for him, it tells me that the peace that Jesus offers is not based upon the absence of problems, but rather the presence of Jesus in our lives. And that's what brings peace that prevails even in the face of adversity. Because for the child of God, God's presence is shalom. His presence, being with God, is shalom. And so we don't have to fake like everything is good when troubles come. In your troubles, you remember that what you're experiencing is part of God's plan. And He's with you in the process. And His, his goal in, for your life isn't to make you happy. But it's to make you holy and to make you like Jesus. And Paul, a few verses later in verse 7, he says, And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your heart and your minds in Christ Jesus. A peace that transcends what we can comprehend. Because he was laying it out for us. He was saying, it's not all going to be easy. It's not going to be great. Life is tough because we're in a broken world. In broken bodies. And sin continues to wreak havoc upon us. And until eternity, we will never fully experience the shalom that we long for. And the shalom that we were created for. But Paul was able to say in these situations to rejoice always. To, to give everything in prayer and petition to God. He says to think on good things, pleasant things. Basically saying, preach the gospel again and again to yourself. That you need shalom. You need God's presence. You need Him. You know, inevitably in the next few days, you'll see a lot on the news about who we lost in 2017. And it'll be celebrities that we've never met. But I want to tell you about someone who we lost in 2017. In fact, I have her obituary picture here. This is Gail Kidd. And she was only with our body here for a couple of years. This is Dallas Burke's mother. And for those who knew her, I've never known someone who faced so much physical adversity. She was constantly in pain with serious back, stomach, migraine, and arthritis issues. And when she went, she went very fast and was unexpected, even though she had lots of adversity and illness. But she longed for relief from her pain, but more than longing for relief from her pain, she longed for Jesus. She longed for Jesus. And she asked that this be put into the program at her funeral. That this be said, God truly blessed me. How could I ever have asked for anything more? You see, shalom isn't found in, in an easy day, getting your way, having a spouse that serves you and meets every need that you have, your job, your church, or friends that exist to satisfy every desire that you have. You see, the glory of God is not in view. And that's uh, those scenarios. The glory of yourself is in view. And as long as you think you're the most important person in the universe, and life is about your comfort, you won't experience shalom. So, let me ask you this. What do you desire more? God's presence or His presence. And I don't say that just to be really cute on words, because I'm being serious about that. And here's why I think so many of us get it wrong. And listen to me carefully. Think about the prayers that you pray. Fix this, do this, give me a good day, keep everybody safe, travel in mercies, the things that we say. And then what do we expect? God doesn't come through exactly the way that we thought he should. And we even prayed and asked him to come through. And we're disillusioned and disappointed with God because we're not worshiping God correctly. Basically, we're worshiping ourselves and asking God to fulfill those hopes and dreams. So remember, shalom is not about you getting everything. It's about God's glory. And that's why when the angels came and said, glory to God, peace on earth, on those whose God's favor rests. God was in view, not us. He came to our rescue so that we could have communion with God and shalom. 
but it's about God. In fact, the verse that we looked at earlier, 2 Corinthians 2, verse 18, I'm going to read the rest of that verse. All of this is a gift from God who brought us back to himself through Christ. And God has given us the task of reconciling people to himself. And so living with God's glory in view says that when I wake up in the mornings, my life is about reconciling people to God. To help them see that that relationship can be restored that was broken. And that discontent you're struggling with in life will not be filled by a new car or a new house or a new wife or a new husband. It can only be filled by God through Jesus Christ. And that's all. So this Christmas, as we open our presents, as we unwrap our gifts, parents, use this as a teachable time to your kids, those who love Jesus, that the presence will ultimately fail you. God's presence will never, ever fail you. You see? Because it's not about you. It's about Him. And He chooses to use us to help other people see. You can be reconciled with God. You can know God. And in the midst of whatever life throws your way, He's there with you. He'll sustain you. And He'll allow you to give glory. And that's why the shepherds could return glorifying and praising God for all the things they'd heard and seen, just as it, they had been told, because they knew this was incredible news. It would change everything. Let's pray. Father God, help us to truly see what the coming of Jesus was all about. God, help us to remove ourselves from the center from the middle and help us to allow Jesus to be in his rightful place. And God, I pray for those in here who know you that everything we do will be about helping other people be reconciled to you, God. So they can have your favor. They can know you and know peace. God, for the seekers, the skeptics, those who are contemplating life and don't really think you're part of that equation, God. I pray the restlessness that they'll experience, the failures that they encounter, the disappointments and broken relationships that they'll inevitably deal with will remind them where true shalom is found. Only in you. We thank you for Jesus. Amen. I want us to take a few minutes of just quiet time while our elders come up and we're going to pass out communion. And communion, what a beautiful time to reflect upon what Jesus did on the cross for us. And if you don't know the Savior, maybe you prayed a prayer, you said the words, you came to the front, you were even baptized. But if you don't know Jesus as your Savior, use the time to, as you receive the communion to say, Jesus, I'm receiving you for real into my life. And I want my life to be transformed and be about you. And those who are believers... Begin to pray about how you can be more about God's business, which is reconciling people to God.